Rob Fox, uh, graduate of the Texas A&M's Master of Land and Property Development Program. I've got Dr. Chris Mulder, uh, a luminary from South Africa and also a graduate of Texas A&M and an outstanding alumni of the university, uh, who is the principal of Chris Mulder Architects Incorporated and CMAI Architects out of Nysna, South Africa. Dr. Mulder is a seventh generation South African uh, who began his career by cultivating the land as a farmer, having graduated with a degree in agriculture in his native country. Along with his wife, Pat, who's a force of nature <laughs> herself, and accompanied by four teenage children, Chris came to Texas A&M to earn his doctorate in environmental design in early 1978. He soon found himself coaching the men's rugby team, uh, probably because of his imposing stature and the fact that he's maybe the only person in 1978 in Texas that knew what rugby was. <laughs> Um, after returning to South Africa at the end of 1980, Chris and Pat, both freshly minted Aggie graduates, launched their design and build firm, CMAI Incorporated, and they've been busy pushing the boundaries of environmental design ever since. Chris has since garnered a number of international accolades, uh, though his status as both the Texas A&M Outstanding Alumnus and the College of Architecture, which was awarded in 2002, uh, and a Texas A&M Outstanding International Alumnus uh, Award in 2011 are probably his most impressive feats, but I think we're all a little bit biased about that. The entire Mulder family uh, now plays a role in furthering Chris and Pat's legacy, as do numerous young designers and developers and other real estate professionals that have learned how to push the design envelope from you and your projects. Uh, is it true? One of the things that we've talked about is, as I was kind of, you know, learning more about your background, and I obviously interned with you and Pat for for three months or so when I was a MLPD student. Uh, but one of the things I've learned is that you've since done, um, and, you know, you studied your ancestry, and you were the, what do you think, great 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 grandson of a black slave winemaker in Cape Town. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. I didn't know it, and. Uh, at some stage, I, I sent my DNA sample to the States. To, I was interested in my heritage. And right. It came back, and now I've realized through the heritage information that I've got that, in, in fact, indeed, the, the person's name was Willem van der Kalk, and he was a black slave, and he, they, he, he was taught to make wine, and became a winemaker of note those days. And he was made a free man and 15 years later, and we could marry a uh, lady and, and had his own wine farm and I have a descendant, direct descendant of that marriage. So it's quite interesting to, to have known that and now the, the, the whole family tree has been built out and built out through information coming from the U.S. and very other parts of, of people who study heritage and DNA. So I'm, yeah, I'm 70% Scandinavian, 20% Iberian and 5-6% East and West Africa. It's amazing. So it's quite a quite a mixed match of people, but uh, that's what it is. And now you're developing wine farm, mixed use urban yeah. villages. <laughs> and you Just mentioned us. Around. You mentioned my family coming here. Of course, we arrived here in 1977. Very innocent, innocent. Never been to the states. Never heard anything about what read about it. And mm -hmm. in those days, it took uh, two weeks for an email letter to get here. And then another week or two from the university to reply, <clears throat> and then another two weeks for the letter to get back. So it took me a, a whole year to get admitted to Texas A&M. And we arrived here very innocent, six people with 12 suitcases, oh, man. put on top of a station wagon. We arrived in College Station. But you made it. <laughs> Could have gone to Michigan. <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> well. Uh, so my first question, getting into uh, getting into the interview portion of this, it's a serious one. What it's was a your serious one. very serious? <clears throat> what was your first experience with Copenhagen dipping tobacco like? <laughs> well, Copenhagen dipping tobacco, I've never heard of in my life when I got here, <clears throat> and I was not a big smoker. Any guy never smoked. I think I smoked for a month in my lifetime. And we got here, and of course, uh, I learned later that snuff and dip and Chewing tobacco was quite a big thing at that time. Mm -hmm. And I arrived at the first rugby practice as a new coach. Uh, I've never met the people. <clears throat> and we got there and the guys were standing in a circle and they were, yeah, doing my this. <laughs> I looked at them and the guy took, put his hand in his back pocket and held a round little can. 
And he said, you want some dirt? And I said, what's that? And the guy said to me, because you never changed your backup before? <laughs> I said, no. And he said, man, you ain't driven yet. <laughs> A true Texan that day. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've mentioned uh, you've mentioned many times. Getting back to the the serious stuff, you've mentioned many times you consider Ian McCard, uh, the land, visionary landscape architect of Design with Nature fame, uh, is your role model. Most Aggies will know uh, McCard's work uh, by the revolutionary natural canal system that he designed for another Aggie, George P. Mitchell, in the Woodlands, Texas. And your work in the Teeson Islands project uh, project tackled drainage concerns of a similar scale. And, uh, you know, while you did that, you worked on a brownfield remediation that ultimately saved an endemic species of seahorse in the Nisna Lagoon. Uh, would you, you know, would you run us through the challenges, or a few of the challenges, uh, that you ran into um, trying to get Teeson Islands entitled and, uh, you know, working on the analysis of the site? Yeah, you mentioned Ian McGaugh. I came across him when I studied the landscape architecture after having studied agriculture, soil science and crop science, and then farmed, as you mentioned, with tobacco and cotton and watermelons. <clears throat> and then I was expropriated by the government then, and I decided to go back studying, completed my master's degree in landscape architecture at the University of Pretoria, and then arrived here, and, and during those studies, I came across, via some of my lecturers at Pretoria, across McGaugh's work, and was fascinated by it. Maybe so more because my background in soil, crop science, and horticulture, and, and reading the land, and that's what I tried to focus on: is to read and understand landscape and land. And I always followed his work. I had the honor to meet him once at one of one of the conferences while we studied here. And, uh, and that's how I started working when we got back on Teeson Island, which was a 180-200 acre island in the center of a very sensitive estuary and lagoon system. And there was a factory on it, a lumber mill, for almost 100 years. And uh, the owners then came to me as a practicing professional those days in the early 80s, or late 80s. And they said, can, what can we do with the island? Because it's in the center of a town, in the center of a sensitive estuary. Uh, what can we do with the island? And then, especially the work on the woodlands and the work that I've seen here and studied here during my studies, the waterfront communities, the uh, intracoastal waterway. Uh, I was fascinated by that. And I realized that there's an opportunity because there are only maybe two islands in the country, maybe three that can be built on, uh, and uh, Thiessen Island was one of them. So the challenge was to develop that island, which was then fairly heavily contaminated by by the lumber treatment process, that you call it womanized pine, I think. Right. It's copper, chrome, and arsenic, and there was a lot of pollution on the land due to the lumber treatment works. And uh, the owners then just wanted to get out. It was bad for the image, it was bad for the reputation, and they decided to get out and they asked me, what can you do with the island? And that's how we started looking at the design of Thiessen Island. It's a process that took uh, seven years, almost eight years to get the entitlements, with huge environmental impact Fast. assessment studies, and uh, yeah, and then we finally, at, on the 26th, design concept, we were happy that we've got a relatively good answer. The biggest, the biggest problem to solve was to raise the level of the island, which was 1.2 meters above sea level, to the statutory required level then of 3 meters. So we had to raise the level of the island from 1.2 to 3 meters. That's 1.8 meters and 6 foot. So you had to find some dirt. <laughs> yeah, we had to find some dirt. You're right. And we did, we're not allowed to bring in dirt from outside the island, and we're not allowed to take off dirt from the island to the mainland. So I had two choices. The first choice was to put all the houses on stilts to get to the 3 meter MSL, medium sea level requirement. And the second one was to find dirt and to raise the level of the island. 
So we designed a series of canal systems that always checked with the engineers how much cut do we get out of the canal if it's this wide, how much cut do we get out of the canal if it's that deep. And so we obviously it was a huge cut and full exercise to put it sort of in its, in its most diluted form. Not to mention it's an island, surrounded by water. Yeah, it's an island. Uh, uh, um, and so we eventually had the canals and then we had to test the hydraulic modeling, the exchange of the water inside the canals, will it not be stagnant, will it not be good, will it not scour, will it not siltate, the siltation and the flow of the, the water in the tides have to be exactly at the right speed, otherwise you get scouring or siltation. Yeah, and we resolved that with a, with, a, with a huge team of very competent professionals that we've put together. And that's how I learned on collaborative uh, participation from various professions, learn how to manage uh, huge uh, professional teams, mm -hmm. and, and how to manage our way through the entitlement process. Well, that uh, kind of leads me perfectly to my next, the next question. Uh, talking about Tucson Islands, you know, while I was an intern at CMAI, uh, when, and dealing with your planners, your landscape architects, your architects, um, you know, one of the most interesting things that I saw is that uh, what you would call sieve analysis, or what a lot of uh, American landscape architects would call sieve analysis, you know, your team basically takes the, the site plan and they layer on different different bits and pieces of geospatial information, whether it's the hydrology of the land or whether it's the topography, whether it's geologic data, uh, but you are layering visually these different layers and you are identifying in the different areas that are appropriate for, for development and maybe not appropriate for development or more appropriate for an agricultural use or whatever it is. Um, you know, and I know that you've said the entire the environmental impact assessment that you did for T Islands was was the longest uh, environmental assessment ever done in, in South Africa at the time. Uh, you know, it seems very complicated, and I'd love to hear you boil down that seed analysis approach because we do things quite differently here. That's you know, we don't necessarily look at the land and look at its best use. We look at a lot of times how much money can we make out of a given piece of land, and then maybe we'll tone it down. <laughs> you know. Yeah, uh, you must again. Let's look at the time scale. That was 1990 uh, when we started the design, and I came back from Texas and university, and here with EIA, a bit of knowledge on EIA procedures, which was not in our country relevant at that time. Uh, there were no EIA procedures, uh, and we started the first designs and had the design sort of semi completed in the end of 1993-94 and we submitted our first application and at the same time 1994 uh, uh, our law or act so called NEMA, National Environmental Management Act came into play just as dark. the EIA act came into play here 10 to 15 years sure. before that time mm -hmm. and they told us you got to start again and, and, and now follow the NEMA procedures which then laid down a series of EIA processes like it was here basically not a copy of, of an EIA process but very similar and uh, we had to do it again and I think for the hindsight it was probably good although we felt you know we lost three years the, the fact that we repetitively go back and check and go back and check and go back and test with a, a, design, a, a huge team not you know it's not a, a thing like this is not a single discipline right. and most of the big land development projects as you know are not single disciplines not and the trick is to manage the, the disciplines and the procedures, right. uh, and uh, we, we were busy with that. Pat, my wife, did a degree and business degree, and the title was project management in the pre-construction phase of a project. Mm -hmm. How do you manage professionals in time and their time and their input, multidisciplinary professionals on a huge project like this? Right. And it still does in good stead. You know, we really, I think, one of our successes, if I may say so, is the ability to do these projects and we focused our whole, with the help of business management consultants that came to us those days and said, what do you want to be known for one day? CMI. And we said, for sensitive coastal development. And every five or six years we had the same management consultants coming back and say, are you still on track? And that was still, and even today we are focusing most of our work on 
coastal sensitive coastal developments or very close to that. And that's how we lived our life and, uh, and, and, and started working. But the, the, the process of getting this island completed, the, the, the approvals, uh, what took seven to eight years. We started construction in September 2000 and we finished by 2008. We sold the whole, all the properties out, the whole development done. So we, we sold and built the island faster than it took us to get the entitlement. Granted, it was 2000, remember, the crash came in 2008, and we started in 2000 with everything rock bottom, and we took the bold step to go into the market and, and started selling, and as we sold, we increased the prices of the properties, and by the end, last phases, we were four times higher than the starting price. So, to get uh, Professor Booth's idea of enduring value that I learned a lot from, uh, the, uh, that is enduring value, I really, without knowing it at that time. And in retrospect, I, I went there and said, this is really what happened, there's economic value, there's environmental value, there's socio-economic value, and there's sensory value, and nobody lost money on Thiessen Island, no investor ever lost money on Thiessen Island, not a single owner lost money on Thiessen Island, and the property values to that are still going up. And that to me is, That's with true. hindsight, <laughs> a perfect example of enduring value. Without a doubt. Well, and, and putting seven to eight years into the entitlement process and all the carrying costs and all the patience and managing equity partners and, and lenders and everything that goes into that, uh, it, it takes it takes a lot of vision and a lot of determination to get that through. Uh, and I would, you know, I hazard a guess that most developers wouldn't have the gut for it. Uh, and it's hard to blame them. But the output is clearly was worth it. Yeah, I think it's all got to do with my... I've got a sign on the side of my door, as you enter my door, that says, uh, the, uh, taking risks is the essence of good, a good life and quality of life. Everything worthwhile doing is risky. Uh, and it's a key to happiness and success, as far as we're concerned. We've taken risks, calculated risks, our whole life. On the farming, we did the same thing. Uh, I bought one farm after the other in 10 years and then was disowned or, 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 or my rent was repossessed by the government. They paid me out. And then I decided to study and get back here and then we applied. And then they froze our bank accounts in, in South Africa. They cut up my credit card and we arrived here with four children uh, and a thousand rand, which was a thousand three hundred dollars in my pocket at that time. That was a risk. Taking a risk at the farm was doing that, and in Thiessen Island there was the same risk. I put the deal together, we got the approvals, and then the client said, what are you going to do now? What can we do? We don't want to develop this. And I said, give me an opportunity and I'll see if I can put a bunch of people together, co-investors. And I did. And we signed them. Get all, we didn't sign. We got all the papers ready and get everything ready. And at the final, after months and months of negotiation and going to the bank, and the bank said, we will, we will loan you the money, but you must sell, pre-sell 70 million rand before the time, before you can start. And Pat and I drove back to, to Cape Town that day to sign the agreements and all the investors were there. And as we drove to Cape Town, which is a four hour drive, the news came and the market crashed. It's a black September, 1998. And we got to Cape Town and the partners were there. And I signed the sale agreement already with the company who was my client. So I'm signing, on the, on the, on, or I can nominate, and I was going to nominate this new bunch of investors with me to buy the property. And we got there and they said, oh, we got to pull out, you know, with the crash in the market, it's impossible. And the, the deal was written to such a, that was a Friday, on a Monday, we're going to, if I keep quiet, the deal is on. If I write the email to the contrary, the deal is off. And we come back and we drove back and Pat said, what are you going to do now? I said, I oh, know, the only thing I know about is to pray and think what happened. And um, we spent the weekend in solitude and on Monday she said to me, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to keep quiet. And the, 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 my, the, fund, the investors phoned me that Monday and they said, well, you, did you send the fax? Are you cancelling the deal? I said, no. 
He said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to keep quiet. He said, they're going to skin your life. They're going to take all the deposit and everything you've done, you're going to lose. We had three months to pay to put up the guarantees. After month one, the stock market started to turn back. After month two, the stock market was exactly where it was before the crash. The guy's phoned me. He says, can we get back in? I said, yeah. Got back in. So we got back in and we paid the deposit. And the rest is history. That's what I mean. The risk I felt it was worthwhile. I was confident that it can work. And I was confident that we can make a success of it. And so incidentally, what's it now? Almost 18 years later, 15 years later, the same thing happened at Crossways. Absolutely. Again. You know, so I think, right uh, with it. <laughs> there's not much risk. I can take more than the rest of my life. But I've done. <laughs> <laughs> you can try. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, one of the things that uh, I think one of the most essential ingredients to CMAI's success has been the way that you approach the land planning. We, we talked about seed analysis, but uh, yeah. one of the things I'd like to circle back in on is uh, your your use of the land. And, uh, you know, again, you know, when we talk about highest and best use in the United States, you know, generally speaking, we're, we're saying usually it's the most intensive uh, type of development because that most of the time is going to net you the greatest amount of, of profit at the end of the day. And uh, one of the principles that CMAI strive, strives to um, educate people on is that certain natural features, whether it's a natural spring or whether it's a wetland or uh, prime farmland, has more value, enduring value, uh, necessarily than just a, a dense housing project or a commercial, you know, a commercial development or something similar. And, uh, you know, your background as a farmer surely is, is what led you down that road. It's probably why you connected with Ian McCarg and his principles. Uh, and so is that, I mean, you've, you've proven an ability to read the land. Is that from your farming experience? Yeah, I would say so. Not only that, but, yeah, understanding the soil, understanding the climate, understanding vegetation, plant growth, uh, soil chemistry, and... What makes things work is one thing. And the other is, there's a couple of items I would say. The one is, we spent, Pat and I spent the three years in China doing development there. And I came in contact with Feng Shui mm -hmm. and how the old Chinese masters learned. And it's not only them. You can go anywhere. I tested it everywhere. I went to Mesa Verde in San, New Mexico and those areas where the Indians used to live. They never built on places where it was not comfortable. Right. The old, African tribes in Southern Africa, they never built in the wrong place. The colonialist farmers that came in never built on the wrong place. The Chinese masters never built on the wrong place. My uh, sort of club says, we've, we forgot all those things. And we tend to go technical and fine, it's work. You have to go to computers to, to, to tell you what is suitable and not suitable. And when I did my, completed my masters, in, in South Africa, I worked for a company for a couple of months, two, three months, and uh, I was the only one with really background in, in natural systems and, and understanding the land and, and understanding things that could happen. And I just want to tell you this one thing. One day we had a big, well, Sun City is now. Uh, the company did the analysis and the planning for that. And uh, we were in a helicopter flying over thousands of acres and hectares looking for spots to develop. In those days they had a computer, huge computer the size of this room, and you fed little cards in it, and punch cards, and read the punches, and you sit and wait, and then the analysis, the suitability analysis came out. This, this pocket of land is more suitable than that one based on the parameters that you put in. And I wasn't that familiar with it then. And I flew in the helicopter and I saw something on the land. We're looking for campsites, good place, uh, uh, bush camps. And I looked down on the helicopter and I saw something and I said, drop me there and you can pick me up in an hour or whatever, I just want to go and look. So they dropped me and I saw a nice big huge rocks and big trees and nice area. And I saw that the animal dung, the game, the zebras and the impala and the kudu dung with a stick in that area. <laughs> so it told me immediately this must be a very protected place because of that. Otherwise these wild animals wouldn't have slept here. And Made almost their base there. Absolutely. 
And they picked me up later and we went to the office and I said to my boss then, that place is the best camp place you've got. He says, no, 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 we've got to go put it through the computer first and then you will see. So they put it through the computer and two days later the phone rang and they says, can you please step into my office? And I said, how the hell did you know that that was such a good place? <laughs> and I told him, I said, that the wild animals stay there, that's the best place. You know, I'm not saying that because I'm not trusting computers, I'm saying that you must have an ability, and you only learn that by practical experience. Yeah, you know? on the we follow that principle today in our office. We never go on the site uh, unless we analyze it and, and compartmentalize it. And what's and you, I think the term is you slow go, no go, and go go. Absolutely. Uh, uh, no go is areas like prime agricultural land. We will never go on prime agricultural land because then we defeat the, the, the object of, of food, of, of food, uh, food security. Which is a world priority. We never go on, on a highly conservation land because we defeat the project of environmental uh, uh, values. So we will always map out before we even start the areas that we can go in, the areas where we can go in very slowly with very careful analysis, and the areas where we shouldn't go in at all. And that instead is a good step through all these almost to say decades, you know, Absolutely. because you can defend that decision. If you're in a public meeting and you, you put your project out for public comment, which we do all the time, uh, if someone says, why did you do that? I can tell him why we did that and why we did not go there and why we did not go there. So you build up, I can almost say, defense systems as we proceed. And as you go through this national environmental management procedure, which means you've got to have public participation, you've got to have public comment and things like that. And I think that's the essence of what we do. And I'm very grateful that I had that experience, first of all in agriculture, then experiencing the different countries and where they build and experience the wisdom of understanding the natural systems. Absolutely. That's it's certainly one of the uh, you know, biggest principles I took away from my internship. Go-go, slow-go, and no-go land use. And that's, uh, it's, it's one of the principles that I want to make sure that we get across to future Aggies. It's, it's very simple, but, but obviously very elegant and very important. And it's, uh, you know, I think the biggest thing that, that we can take away from that is that some things are sacred. And, um, you know, we have another Aggie luminary, uh, Dr. Philip Tabb, who was the land planner on the Serenby project that's right outside of Atlanta. And, you know, I've toured Serenby and met with members of the development team, as have you and, and Pat. Um, and from what I've seen of Crossways in my time in South Africa, you know, Serenby is probably the, the closest corollary to the type of agrarian urbanism that you, you are delivering out at Crossways Farm Village. And I wanted to read a quote uh, from Philip Tabb because I think it, it captures what we're talking about here. Uh, you know, he's written extensively uh, in one of his books, I think mean, Serene Urbanism, talks about the everyday sacred, which is talking about a, a slower and more intentional which is a traditionally rural way of life. And uh, what he says is that, you know, Serenby is informed by these rural values, honoring the wisdom of the elders, acknowledging our responsibility to future generations, self-sufficiency, financial prudence, neighbors helping neighbors, living simply, and finding joy every day in the wonder of existence. And so, you know, that to me is the is the heart and soul of what Crossways Farm Village is, is providing to South Africa, along with the economic benefits to the to the rural townships that are that are having hard economic times now. Uh, can you give us a, a, an idea of where Crossways is headed in the future and what you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, I think I've tried the Crossways concept in the state or province where we live. Yeah, and I've, I've got my nose bloody three times for three different projects because the, the authorities granting entitlements just couldn't grasp the idea. My idea was to get, well first, let me back, down, back up first, 55% of the population of South Africa lives in rural South Africa. The different nations or tribes or language types or whatever, they're all different. And 55% of the total population, all races live in rural South Africa. The rest of us live in what they call urban edges, with an urban area and our 
planning system defines that you have to draw an urban edge around the town. Similar to Portland, Oregon. Yeah, it's, it, it's basically there for, to, to let the municipal authority manage their budgets in terms of infrastructure expenditure. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I, I, my passion is if we can't solve the, uh, the living conditions or the way of life for rural South Africa, we, we will never make it. And so uh, we come up with this thing of, of, of an agri-village or an agri-hood or, or a rural new town, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I've got approval for Crossways based on the principles of food security, uh, job creation, poverty alleviation, training. And that's what it basically was because I, I looked at little villages or little hamlets that was living there outside the urban areas with no jobs, no opportunity. And uh, I said, I uh, identified pockets of land and, and we found this place. And uh, fortunately, there was a big school, a boarding school, a thousand kids on a neighboring property, which is a big benefit. Otherwise, you know, school, you got to build school. So there was a school on a double lane freeway, 30 minutes from the airport. Very rural. And 400 cows on 120 hectares of irrigated pastures, lots of water which is also a benefit. And we've identified that and we did the application and we succeeded. It was, it was agreed that it will be the first rural new town. Uh, and we do our own service, our own water, our own sewer plant, our own electrical plant. We, we, we buy in bulk and distribute high-tech fiber optics, everything in rural South Africa. Similar to a utility district here in the yeah. United States. So, in Texas. Uh, and that's how it started and got approved. And I think if we can make, and, uh, and that's why Pat and I are moving there now. We're selling on Teeson Island, which are people <laughs> looked at this. Are you selling Teeson Island? I said, yeah. I says, well, then it must be a hell of a place where you're moving to. <laughs> and it is. Uh, so we're happy to do that. Uh, and then we're gonna, I'm going to spend my, probably it's my, my swan song there in, in getting this thing built and sold and designed and planned. I think you'll live to be 100. Taking risks so again. <laughs> Taking risks again at my age. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's exciting, you know, I think for, for every Aggie that's going to watch this video, and certainly for me, growing, growing up in a small town in Texas, it's exciting to see Aggies, you know, you, Phil Tab, you know, all the, the various instructors we have today, we're pioneering and growing urbanism at Texas A&M, as we should be. It's exciting to see I that. just want to add that, you know, uh, the world, the world, all over, develop as hamlets, a couple of people living together, protecting together, and, and protecting each other, usually on, very, on sites which has good visibility to see the enemy coming on, usually on sites where the water drained well, not soggy or boggy or whatever, and that's what I'm saying. You need to understand the land to do that. So these villages and hamlets were all at good places and then they got more and more and a couple of hamlets fed into a village mm -hmm. and the village when later on there was a church or a sheriff or a policeman and this is the same in America in the old mm -hmm. days, same as in our country, same as all, era, all over, a couple of villages formed, supported, the, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of hamlets supported the village mm -hmm. and then a couple of villages supported the town and then a couple of towns supported the city. Sure. That's, the, spoke. that's the yeah. historical world development pattern. And I'm trying to say we can today do very contemporary, very nice little villages and hamlets in the rural areas without taking away from the, the environment or the economy and boost the economy. Absolutely. And speaking about the economy, and you know, we've talked a lot about the environment and, and the value of the land. One of the other aspects that uh, all developers have to look at is, is affordability. And, uh, you know, going back briefly to Serenby, Steve Niger, the developer of Serenby, you know, has uh, addressed the challenge of affordability in that community. And I, I would say with new urbanist style projects in general, one of the main critiques that's leveled at them is that they ultimately end up being unaffordable for the average American or South African or wherever they're built. And, uh, you know, in Serenby, they have addressed that by introducing uh, density, controlled density, in a clustered land development plan in at the crossroads and also a mix of housing types so you have a variety of, of dense you know everything from attached townhomes to uh, more suburban sized homes to rural estates and, and things of that nature and so 
you know, we have a, a very real affordable housing crisis in San Antonio, where I work, and throughout Texas. And obviously in South Africa, you're, you're battling the same, mm. the same issues. South Street Village is one of your projects that, that uh, tackled that issue. What advice can you give uh, Aggies, uh, whether, wherever they work, whether it's in Texas or abroad, uh, how do we combat affordable housing? Yeah, I'm, I'm a great believer or disciple of TNDs and traditional neighborhood design. I had the opportunity to went to uh, Seaside in Florida years ago, met Andrews Duaney, went to his classes, went to his stuff. So that had a profound impact on, on our practice. The study, this work that I've done here at Texas A&M in my days with the comparing land use laws of Florida and Hawaii as my thesis had a profound impact. The whole Texas A&M experience had a profound impact on our entire lives. Mm -hmm. and, and, and based on, on that, we, we always, and based on the requirement of what I said, the, the four values, you know, mm -hmm. and the fact that we have to provide for rural development. Mm -hmm. We always provide very small lots and in medium lots and in middle sized lots and big lots and we always have regulatory regulation plans, urban regulations, site regulations, etc. Mm -hmm. And we always mix the sizes between each other. Uh, our smallest lots at Crossways are smaller than the government subsidized housing lots. <laughs> but the government subsidized housing lots is, is a rectangle of 20 by 15 with a 5 meter building line. By 15 meters. So, you know, it's, it's useless, it's nothing. I, tell, I told the minister, you're building slums as we speak, sir. Because you don't provide, you don't look at parking, you don't do the regulation. And he came to Crossways and I sold him, uh, told him our lots and showed him our lots, which is smaller than a, 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 than a what can you, a regular like a suburban government, government okay. lot, you know. Okay. But the, the configuration of that lot is not 20 by 15, it's 7.3 by 30. And then we design a house that fits in there. And it's totally different. And he couldn't believe his eyes. And so we have very small lots, 70 meters away from a very big lot. Uh, and all in between. And, and I think that's what makes it a, to us a, a nice livable community. And so there's, there's a couple things that, that we can pull out of that. I mean, one thing that I did not hear and is, uh, is subsidized housing that's, that's making use of government grants or things like no. that. Now, you do work with, uh, in kind of a private, par a private public partnership kind of way with the local government, but it's not capital A affordable housing like we have in the States. And then the other, the other thing I pulled out of that is that the diverse housing types are not segregated. You're not, no. you're not building estates over here mm -hmm. in suburban homes over here. <coughs> you're mixing it. Absolutely. So whether you're starting out with your first home or whether you're retiring into an estate, you're, you're right next door. Yeah. And you're going to interact with yeah. those folks. That's how a community should be. Absolutely. It's always been like that. You can't force it. You can't segregate it. That's the way it is. Mm -hmm. And we, we were blatantly honest in the beginning. We can't do subsidized housing because we're privately funded. Right. I will do subsidized housing if the government comes in and tell me. But then they must buy the land, or they must provide the land, or they must provide something, then we'll do it. We're trying to now. Mm -hmm. We're in fact busy as we speak, trying to get there. There's also, incidentally, 14, 15 million people in South Africa living on tribal land. Mm -hmm. Where the tribal chief, or the king, or whatever, owns the land, and he's got all these subjects mm -hmm. living on the land, which pays a rent to him. One of our previous presidents called them tin pot dictators, because they're just take money from the people, they've got no title, they can't borrow against the land, they can't borrow against their house, they can't send, uh, like everybody else in property do, take a bond on their house and put your kids through school. There's no path to prosperity. So, yeah, so I'm trying, I'm very much, as we speak, busy with some two or three tribal leaders saying, listen, let us help you, let's build a modern little village and a hamlet here with enduring value mm -hmm. that you can Get your, you, you can give the land to the people, you've already given it, but give them that title. Let's do a nice village, let's plan it correctly, let's do the regulation plans and guidelines and then people, then the, the property value can increase. The moment the, 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 the stuff that the government is putting out now, the moment the people go and live in there, the value only goes one way, and that's down. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a very similar situation with our experiments of government subsidized housing in the United States, yeah. for sure. Well, you know, one of the, you talk about enduring value also and, and, and continuing down this path. Um, we've, got, we've got affordability and sustainability are kind of, you know, two of the big themes that we're talking about. And 
uh, one of the things that I noticed in South Africa was um, the use of uh, low-tech green solutions, which helps with both affordability and sustainability. You know, in the U.S., we have a, uh, an architect named Steve Muzon, mm -hmm. uh, who I'm sure, I'm sure you're very well acquainted with. Um, he wrote a book called Original Green, and one of the things that he talks about is, you know, any area of the world you go, whether it's the Bahamas or South Africa or wherever, they have living traditions. And those living traditions are found in their architecture, they're found in their land planning. In, um, you know, in South Africa, one thing I noticed is that nobody has AC. Nobody has a, 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 air, a centralized air conditioning yeah. unit. But you do have operable windows, which you don't see everywhere in the United States, or if they are operable, you know, they're, they're very cheesy. You can, you can break them off with your thumb pretty easily, because nobody ever opens their windows. Uh, and so, one of the things I'd like to just like to get an idea from you on is if you if you or, or me or any of the Aggies that are listening were to build a new rural town in College Station or in San Antonio, and what are those elements that we should be concerned about? What are those living traditions that we should think about? Do you think? Well, as far as we're concerned, you know, uh, we've made it mandatory rainwater harvesting. Mm -hmm. I always tell the people in my office and the young people. Your generation is going to fight about water. It's not a, it's not a secret. The water is going to be all over the world, be a commodity that's getting scarcer and scarcer. So we got to do everything from rainwater harvesting off the roofs, off the roads, everything, and retaining as much as water. And for instance, at at Crossways, there's not a single stormwater pipe, not a single one. On this island, there's ground. not a single stormwater pipe. We have drains and swales and capture ponds and stuff like that to reharvest the water. So our water harvesting is absolutely prime, uh, and then solar energy today, the technology is advancing so fast that uh, you can live off solar very easily. Yeah, you always have a bit of standby emergency power on overcast week or so, but our climate in South Africa is so great, you know, that we uh, where we are in most areas. It's Almost not, Mediterranean. Yeah, it's, 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 it's just wonderful climate, uh, and, and we live outside, the doors are open. And that's it, you know, so we can very easily adapt and make provision. Uh, I've been to Singapore last year, we won two awards, one for Crossways and one for Teason Island for two categories. And I saw the most wonderful rainwater harvesting system there. And I've imported them there and I've put them into my house on Teason Island and other places. And I think it's, uh, that's what we do. The Singaporeans and the Chinese are now way ahead of us all in terms of greening towns and greening systems. and everything and I think there's a I said to the guys in my office and you know, there's a new breed of professional emerging out of all of us. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Chinese cities, it's not like one mega city, it's like thirty or forty that they're working on at the same time. Absolutely. Singapore is a green city. They're on the they on they're on the cutting edge of, of greening the cities and greening the world. So we can learn a lot of them. Mm -hmm. When when I studied here there was a mm, most of the most of the awards, the different faculties or the, the best students were were foreigners. Mm -hmm. And I sat there as a foreigner myself, and I looked at this and I said, "What? The, where the hell is the Americans? You know, they're not right. they're not there." And these guys come and they graduate, they learn the language, they come into a new country, they learn the language, they adapt, they finish their degrees, and they go back home and they take technology there. And I think we've we've just fallen behind. Uh, and, and, and we need to breed a new professional, a mixture between architect, landscape architect, land planner um, and some environmental people that's going to manage these new green cities in the future. Absolutely. I, I agree. I think we all see that, you know, that same problem here. Uh, you know, and, and you need somebody that uh, has the business acumen to tie it all together mm. and, and uh, we need to we need to assess that and make it part of our value identification process you know, early on in the feasibility the same way that, that you'll do. Makes in, in Singapore last year there were boards and boards of this uh, International Federation of Landscape Architects meeting mm -hmm. and 80-90% of the winning awards were either Chinese or Singaporean. 80-90%. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. <laughs> they're being confronted with that problem today yeah. and they're, they're trying to do it the right way. Which is good to see. Well, you know, one of uh, I'm trying to think some you know some of these other principles that I, I saw while I was interning with you was uh, you know there's a couple of counterintuitive lessons that uh, that I learned 
that uh, you never see here in the United States. And, uh, and one of them is labor-intensive design. Uh, just as an example, all of the street-like housings in, in crossways and also on Tyson Islands were, were hand-carved, I believe it was by, by local mm. artisans. Hand-carved or, or hand-crafted, depending on metal or wood or whatever they're based out of, but they contributed so much to the streetscape because they're all very unique. Uh, but what most people that walk those streets may not know is that it's a local who's being gainfully employed um, to build that that sense of community and that sense of place in those villages. What what led you uh, what led you to go down that path, and how do you justify that in your financial models? Labor intensive design seems counterintuitive. I don't know what needs the biggest justification: creating jobs, mm -hmm. because our, our, our jobless or unemployment rate is like twenty seven or thirty percent in the country. So on every on every on every um, entitlement application for a project, the first thing, one of the most, how many jobs are you going to create? And we sat as a design team in our office, and everybody said, "How can we create jobs?" You know. And the easiest thing in the world would be to take a catalog from an American street light manufacturer or sure. Italian or German, and paste this. I want a hundred of those, and two hundred of those, and three hundred of these. And then the money goes out of the country and you put in, you put in. It's a hell of a lot more hassle to design a street light. Which first of all, it must look pretty and it must be functional. And then it must comply with the electrical rules. Code, yeah. <laughs> so, but we, we did it. We decided to design street lights on Tees and Island, ball outs and toll lights and street lights and everything. And it was a lumber town, it was a lumber mill, it was a lumber factory. The whole town is surrounded by forest, indigenous forest, and planted forest. Uh, and we decided, let's make street lights for, for, for these people. And we, we created a hell of a lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. And the same with crossways. We do the same thing. We have local people making the light. One guy makes the footing, other guy makes the light. There's a blacksmith doing the metal strapping work. So we've got three contractors making the lights, and we just buy the light footing and put it in. And it creates so much goodwill and so much benefit, not only the street lights, road paving, brick paving, brick patterns, we all employ the local people and local labor intensive design to do that. And it works in your financial model. Of You're course. still making a profit. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, one of the, uh, you know, there, there's two values I think I associate with you and with Pat and with the CMAI team, and, and that's, you know, it's stewardship and shepherding. And we've talked a lot about stewardship today. We've, we've talked about uh, how, how you are taking care of the environment, you're looking at the environment first, and then uh, kind of working your development project around the environment so that you were, you know, you're, you're truly a steward of the land and the land comes first. Shepherding, though, to me, is, uh, you know, you're tending a flock. And one of the most amazing things that I saw at CMAI was that you've got a whole team of young designers and, and young construction managers that are maybe in their 20s, and it's just, a lot of them is their first job in the industry. And, and you and Pat and the rest of the partners, Eugene and Steph, have set up a system where these young designers can essentially buy stock in the CMI company and they can profit from, they can profit directly from their work and the quality of their work impacts how they're living beyond just a standard salary. And, you know, you can explain it a lot better, but, you know, you're essentially not taking stock out of the company when you leave. It's, you say you go in, you go in naked, and you leave naked, right? But uh, naked. <laughs> but naked. <laughs> can you can, can you explain why <laughs> why that was important to you and and uh, and, and how that works? At, at the beginning, when we started the firm, we weren't that you know, and we talked to advisors and financial advisors, and mm -hmm. we had a very good financial advisor and says, listen, if you're going to get stock, and you want to sell stock every time. A partner leaves the company or come in, you'll have to do a valuation of the company to determine the value of the stock. And it's always, not always, but mostly it ends up in a fight, you know. Why don't you just make a rule? You don't sell stock, you don't buy stock. Mm -hmm. So that was that we've been for 40 years going now. And I'm almost butt naked, but at the end of next year I'll go out naked. I'm not <laughs> selling any stock. And uh, because I've given away stock and the guys who got the stock got it for free. When they leave the company, they put the stock on the table and they leave. Right. What they gather and accumulate while they are a shareholder or while they are a director, if we invest 
we're always in this something in the, in the development that we do as a group. That group that invests in that specific building or a specific lot or a specific thing, that they keep it there and they get dividends. While they, with this profit to share, they get a dividend share. But when they leave, they put the stock on the table for the next night to pick it up. I never had to value the company. I never was forced to value the company. People come and leave, they know it when they get in, and they know it when they get out. I know it too. I started it, so I've got to, I'm going to be butt naked next year or year after next. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, before we run out of time here, I, I want to make sure to address one other, one other story. Uh, it wasn't my last day, but uh, Chad Long and I were sitting sitting with you and your family at the uh, dinner table, and you told a story that kind of purposely, or per, excuse me, perfectly captures rural values and paying it forward and these different themes that we've touched on today. Um, you told a story that had us all kind of on the verge of tears. We're talking about the birth of your eldest daughter, I believe, and Pat was uh, was in Pretoria and going into labor. And you were still a farmer at the time, trying to sow your fields. Would you mind recounting that story for, for everyone else? I don't want to go too much detail because it's getting emotional there. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was so Pat was expecting our first child and I was on the farm, uh, planting on a new farm that I leased and I had to get the crop in. You know, we plant two, three crops a year. With our climate there, we plant a winter crop, a summer crop, and maybe an in-between quick crop. Mm -hmm. So it was like this all the time. And I had to plant, the, the time was gone, and uh, my, my parents called me and said, Pat's going in. And I had to make a choice, and there was a neighbor there, he says, don't worry, go. And um, a week later I came back, two weeks later we came back, and the guy plowed and planted my whole crop for me. And I said, what do I owe you? He says, nothing. He just pay it forward. You're going to meet... Young people in your life that will need it. And you have. Yeah. <laughs> You've got a whole legacy, you and Pat and the rest of your family, the whole legacy of young Aggies uh, like myself and young designers in South Africa uh, that have benefited from from that neighbor's advice and yeah. what you've done. His name was Uncle Pete. Uncle Pete. And every time I hear something or somebody approaches me for help or assistance, I hear Uncle Pete's voice. That's exactly, uh, that's exactly the story that I think it just, it, it was the perfect way to end my internship in South Africa. And that's something that I think Chad and I, I know have, have taken to heart. And, it's, and it hits at the core of everything that CMAI is trying to do for the world and specifically for rural areas. Uh, that's, in my mind, that's a rural agrarian value. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't know a better way to put it's it. It's an enduring so, value too. It is, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> Well, that, uh, I think that's the perfect note to end on, Chris. Thank you very much. For well, thank you, Rob, and again, my appreciation. You know, in Texas A&M, it's such a profound impact on our lives that I can never say thank you enough. I'll see you. Thank you, sir.